Well, um, when the you know, transition economies got started, um, there was a transformation of uh, public assets into private assets, um, very large scale uh, privatization in uh, Russia and in Eastern Europe, uh, less in China where land, both urban and urban land remains entirely state owned and the rural land, uh, there's no market. People have some kind of ownership, but they can't buy and sell the land, right? So there are some differences there. But uh, what you're trying to do is to take companies, housing, a lot of uh, physical assets and move them from the public sector into the private sector. And uh, it was handled better in some countries than in others. Um, and uh, in, uh, you know, unfortunately, in Russia, for example, um, a lot of uh, billionaires were created rather quickly, uh, people who had uh, favored uh, outcomes in the privatization process. Uh, so why does, why does wealth inequality go up in different transition countries? It goes up for different reasons. It can go up if you somehow give what were state assets to a selective group, small selective group of people which is roughly speaking what happened in Russia, or you can go from a communist situation where uh, there's very little private ownership of anything, and uh, so the Chinese case is one where you open up the market, uh, you allow people to build up their personal assets, and if they start from a situation of relative equality, but because some people are better entrepreneurs than others, um, there are you know, unequal outcomes, and wealth is formed through the accumulation of profits and saving from year to year. And so it's quite natural that if you start from a very equal situation, you unleash the market, you will have increasing inequality. Well, it, I think it's significant because people are thinking globally more and more, you know, um, we, we're facing issues that affect us all. Take uh, climate change, for example. You know, and I think these things are, in a sense, drawing us together and making us realize that we're all in the same boat. Um, so people are more interested in, in what these differences are. And then when you begin to look into it, you, you discover there really are these enormous differences between countries. It has all kinds of consequences. For example, if you think in terms of the uh, Ebola uh, outbreak uh, in West Africa at the moment, a large part of the problem is that the countries where this is happening are some of the absolute poorest countries in the world. They don't have the capacity to uh, deal with the problem, and they're not receiving very much help internationally. Um, you know, and so this kind of thing, uh, I, I think, is uh, making people more aware of why it's a problem. And yes, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, on the global level, what's happening, the big thing is that a very large number of people who are at the bottom of the world income and wealth distribution are moving up. They're coming up in the distribution. When we look at the numbers, we look at our charts, we can see this this uh, this very large movement. Um, you know, it's almost a vast uh, change, um, and in global terms, that's very equalizing. Um, so it's true that uh, within both of those countries, uh, inequality has been uh, trending up. Um, but on the global scale, that's less important than the fact that uh, large populations of relatively low-income people are moving up in the distribution. So overall, you know, although in every country, or most countries in the world today, people see rising inequality in their own country, it's kind of paradoxical that globally, uh, income inequality at the moment is actually going down. Uh, well, I think it is a matter of concern, and it is a matter of concern to the governments and the people in those countries. So if you, you take China, for example, uh, um, 
both the government and the academics and uh, other organizations and agencies in China have been um, concerned about the rising inequality. They're trying to, they're monitoring this, they're thinking about what to do about it, they're wondering if their growth strategy uh, uh, should have uh, taken these aspects more into account. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a, definitely a matter of concern, but we're learning uh, what you can do. And the Latin American example is very interesting because uh, in Mexico and Brazil and a number of other uh, Latin American countries, uh, they've got new approaches to helping out uh, low-income people. Don't just hand them money the way we've often done in the uh, developed countries. Uh, you give them money under certain conditions. They send their children to school. They, they, definitely, they come to school and they have a certain attendance record. Uh, the parents are required to do various things, and uh, it's uh, very supportive and encouraging, and the uh, results are, uh, are pretty impressive. So these, these uh, new ideas, are, you know, it's a little bit like microfinance, you know, which is a little bit controversial, but I think overall has been a, a positive development. Um, so people are thinking of new ways of uh, approaching uh, uh, the inequality problem within countries. Well, I, I think it's uh, very important. And uh, this is another fascinating phenomenon, right? So, you know, uh, what happened and why we had the crisis and so on had a lot to do with inequality. Um, inequality started to rise in the U.S. in the mid-1970s and just went up and up. And um, <sighs> leads to various things. So uh, people at the bottom see the lifestyles of the people higher up in the distribution. Uh, they aspire to have the same kind of living standards and so on as uh, people who are moving up more rapidly than they are. And um, so this feeds the uh, desire to uh, borrow, um, remortgage your house, uh, and so on, right? So, you know, in the period up to the crisis, we saw a great deal of borrowing. And then the other aspect of it is that politicians, um, in that case, uh, responded to, uh, you know, what people wanted uh, in ways that they thought were helpful, and lots of people thought were helpful at the time, making it easier for people to borrow, get a mortgage, get settled in a house, and so on in the U.S. And the whole thing blew up, as we know, right? Um, and I think that if there hadn't been this uh, strong increase in inequality that had been going on at that point for almost 20, it's almost 30 years, um, the, this whole um, subprime borrowing mess may well never have developed. Um, and there are other aspects. So the increase in inequality meant that there are high-income people who've got a lot of spare cash, uh, they have to invest this money. This helped to drive interest rates down. Of course, many other things were happening to interest rates, but it did mean that there are loanable funds that have to be lent out to somebody. And then on the other hand, you have the lower and middle income people who are struggling, who uh, take advantage of consumer credit and uh, their ability to you know, borrow to buy houses and so on, to kind of recycle this excess income that's coming from the top of the tree. Uh, and again, that fed the problem. Um, so, you know, maybe we've uh, learned something from that experience and we can avoid uh, some of these difficulties in the future. Mm -hmm.